Um, this is John from the Keystone College uh, Professional Development Institute. I am the Director of Corporate Relations, and we're going to get started now. Um, we see as our participants are growing. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon, as well as Bill Aquilina, who will be on the camera um, in a minute, from Checkmate Consulting. I want to give a shout out to my partner, Janet Jones, who's the Director of Professional Development at Keystone College. And a huge thank you to Gina from the Wyoming County Chamber and all of the Regional Chamber of Commerce Group for letting us do this webinar today. And we hope that it uh, helps everybody and gives some insight. Um, before we get started, uh, I want to just give you a little bit about the Keystone College Professional Development Institute. Um, Keystone College uh, started the Professional Development Institute in November of 2019. Um, Janet and I, myself are brand new employees, and we were here brought in to um, kind of invent the Pro Professional Development Institute. Um, so with that being said, uh, we work with all business, industry, and all the community to enhance continuing education, workforce development, and customizable training in any of these um, sectors. Um, you know, we need a uh, side note, during these times, uh, we could offer any program and training online through a virtual format that any business or industry or community group may need. We do have some upcoming programs in the month of May that we're doing through a virtual Zoom um, that'll be live and interactive. Um, on May 13th, we have collaboration and teamwork in changing times. And on May 21st, we have managing, in, managing change in this challenging time. We have so many different additional certification programs on our website that could be offered in an online um, format at any time. Some examples are per project management certificate, continuing education for project managers, human resources, continuing education for human resource professionals, um, nonprofit management certificate, and there's a whole lot more. Uh, you can check it out at www.keystone.com and just click on the continuing education icon and you'll get all the information. Um, we also put in place in the last couple months uh, six certificates that are credit bearing that are a pathway to a degree. Um, they're up on our website. You can check those out. And just keep checking out our social media pages. We enjoy doing this, as well as the Keystone College website. And now I'm going to turn it over to Bill, who is going to get started with our ethical leadership program. And thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, this is Bill Aquilino. We're going to get the PowerPoint pulled up here. We just need to go into presentation mode. Thank you very much. Can uh, hopefully everyone can see that. If anyone can give me a uh, a thumbs up or uh, let me know that, that you can see that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, all right, we got some thumbs up here. Thanks, Julian. I appreciate it. Again, my name is is Bill Aquilino. I maintain a human resources compliance and legal compliance practice in the Scranton area. Uh, it's something I've been doing for a number of years. Um, I also have been an attorney for the past 25 years and am a SHRM certified human resources professional, a HCRI human, certified human resources professional, and I'm certified in ethical leadership by the NASPA Center for the Public Trust. Um, one of the things that I want to do today is make this educational and, and um, two-way. Um, all of you have been probably sitting through Zoom lectures over the past two months, and, and lectures are, are, are the best way to do it through Zoom, but maybe aren't the best way to um, provide synchronous education. So hopefully through the question and answer function, the attendees can provide me with some questions, and we can interrupt the uh, prepared statements in order to answer those questions. Um, I'd like to thank the um, Wyoming County Chamber of Commerce and certainly the Keystone College Professor, Professional Development Institute for all that uh, you provided to me in support of this presentation. Um, and at the end, they'll have some additional, additional comments for you. Um, Once upon a time in a, in a land far, far away, um, the Roaring Twenties were on their way. The 
2020s, not the 1920s. We had a economy that was burning hot. We had record highs with respect to the stock market, record lows with respect to unemployment. And um, all of a sudden, COVID-19 hit. Um, things changed for all of us. We are out of the workplace. We're disjointed from the people that we work with and, and spend most of our time with. And we're now spending more time with our family members uh, than, than we ever did before. We are in a crisis with respect to uh, the economy, with respect to whether or not our businesses are going to continue in the same fashion that they did before. Um, and many of us uh, have faced ethical crises. Please go um, Thanks, we've had it. No problem. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, this is our seminar wish list. This is these are the things that I hope to um, discuss while we're going through the process here. Initially, I want to discuss what the term ethics means. Um, where do our ethical principles come from? We certainly all have individual ethics, but we also have institutional ethics. Um, the most important driver of our ethics for institutional ethics, our mission, vision, and values. We're going to discuss some of the guiding principles and the relationship with corporate culture, and also whether or not our mission, vision, and values provide incentives for ethical behavior or are something that are working against employees and other people related to the business, including stakeholders, to make ethical decisions. Um, certainly, we can all make ethical decisions when they're easy. We're gonna go over the difference between ethical decisions during a time of um, transition and ethical decisions in a time of chaotic decision-making. Probably one of the most important things that we're gonna talk about and hopefully the biggest takeaway from the um, process is ethical frameworks. We're gonna go over two of them, consequentialism and deontology. And then we'll also have an opportunity to uh, go through all of your questions. Let's see, we have a uh, chat. Okay, not a question. And then I'm going to provide you with some additional information, um, both about um, the Professional Development Institute, uh, some of the things that I do, and then provide you with some additional guides for um, getting additional information that you can use while you're at home. There we go. Um, so what are ethics? Ethics are the moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the completion of an activity. Uh, seems easy enough, but the question is, you know, where do these come from? Um, where, do, where do we get our moral principles? A lot of the questions that I get um, in my practice related to moral principles are, Okay, I understand that we're talking about moral principles, but but what are they? Sometimes when I partner from other people with other people, my gut tells me that what we're doing is, is wrong. Um, are my moral principles different than others, or are others seeing things through a different lens? I've tried to apply moral principles consistently, but different situations tend to have different rules. It seems like there's different rules for work. There's different rules that I use in my personal life. There's different rules that I use when I'm speaking with my boss versus when I'm speaking with my coworker, um, things like that. I want to talk a little bit about the world of ethical decision making. Um, obviously, what we're talking about is the ethical gray area. A lot of us face ethical decisions every day, and we're able to make them quickly. 5% um, roughly of, of all the ethical decisions we make, we know what's obviously wrong. Those are the situations where um, you work at a bank, you have the opportunity to steal money out of the petty cash or move money between accounts. You know that's obviously wrong. Those are the 5% of things that none of us do without knowing that it's wrong. And then there are things that are obviously right. Um, you know, if you are going through expense reports and you find that one of your uh, entries was 
inappropriate, you accidentally use the corporate credit card instead of your personal credit card, and you owe the company $12 for a lunch. Um, you know because you're the one that approves the expense reports that you can just approve that, the $12 will go through and there won't be any questions. Um, you know that it's obviously right for you to switch that over to your personal credit card and you do that and um, you probably don't think about it again because it was a one-time mistake. We all know the things to do that are obviously right. What we're talking about is that huge 90% plus in the middle that is the ethical gray area. If you think about it in, in more layman's term, the things that are obviously wrong, um, if the police found out, those are things you would get in trouble for. The things that are obviously right, if you did something and you told your mother about it and she would be proud, those are the obvious, obviously right things. Um, in a time of crisis like we're in now, the framework of what is necessarily right and what is necessarily wrong is completely different because of all the external pressures that we have. It's, it's not you just um, sitting in a room making ethical decisions all day long in a vacuum, the obviously right and the obviously wrong. There are external pressures and those pressures are created by decreased budget, um, decreased support from the people around you. And we're facing a lot of, of ethical issues that we don't normally um, find ourselves in when we have uh, a non-pandemic situation. Let's, let's go through a couple of examples. Um, how did I get here? You, the first thing that you need to think about when you're faced with making an ethical decision is, as you know, how did I get here? And I'm gonna give you a couple of uh, interesting um, examples, but they're real world examples. They're things that we go through every day. Um, I use some of these when I, when I teach my students about ethics. The first one is, uh, I know that's not a potato, okay? Um, you walk into the kitchen, for example, and you hear your seven, you see your seven-year-old trying to draw something. She holds it up and asks you, what do you think? You've read parenting books and have no intention of putting your child into a years of expensive therapy, so you say, that's great, honey. Satisfied with your, with your superior parenting skills, you turn to walk away. But wait, there's more. You see it coming. It's the question you've been warned about. Daddy, do you even know what this is? As you analyze the drawing, which clearly looks like a potato on stilts, you wonder, is this a horse? Is this a dog? Is this a table? Um, seemingly attuned to your confusion, your daughter says, it's a dinosaur. Is it good? You've heard your spouse respond to this one, and you know what the right answer is. That's the best insert animal here, in this case, uh, dinosaur, I've ever seen. Triumphantly, you leave the kitchen knowing that by telling a little white lie, you have saved your child's delicate psyche. The next uh, example that I use that we're going to go over is called the other shoe. And this is something that I think many of us uh, frequently come into contact with during uh, the workplace. So you're sitting in your office and you hear a knock at the door. At the same time, the door opens and your direct supervisor walks in and sits down. He's been a good friend of yours since high school and helped you get a job. Basically, by putting in a good word for you, uh, he got you the job that you have, and is a lot, which has allowed you to um, feed your family and, and raise your kids and, and do all the things that you want to do in the workplace. Your boss, however, um, is not that great of a worker. He takes sick time to play golf. He takes credit for his team's work, and he plays it loose and fast with the expense reports. Um, your, his bonus is tied to performance reviews and he selected you to review his work for the year. He says, I know we're tight, so I need you to fill this out for me. Don't give me all 10. So it looks like, um, it's obvious that you and I had a discussion, throw in some eights and nines too. So it doesn't look too suspicious and remember to comment on my leadership skills. I would say I owe you one, but instead I would say we're, we're even meaning uh, that he got you the job. He gets up, gives you the thumbs up, and walks out. These are two vastly different situations. Um, one's a workplace situation, one seemingly innocent, one seemingly not. 
but they have a lot of things in common. You feel that no one's hurt by your lie to your daughter. And, but on the other side, your lies about the performance review will get your supervisor an undeserved bonus. Uh, pretending to like the potato on stilts avoids an afternoon of pouting and crying. But there's some question, are you doing the right thing um, by doing a favor for a friend who shaded the truth um, to help you get a job? So let's, let's talk about where these ethical rules come from. They come from the environment, the environment that we grew up in. Um, studies generally show that by the time you're somewhere between 16 and 18, your moral compass or the part of your brain that identifies moral, uh, positive moral issues and negative moral issues has already been fully developed. So we're not really learning these things as much on the work in the workplace as we think we are. Uh, we're not learning them in college as much as we think we are, even though we have classes on ethical rules, uh, leadership, business ethics, things like that. We have ethical rules that come from the legal and regulatory requirements that apply to our businesses. Um, but remember, those legal and regulatory requirements are a floor, they're not a ceiling. Um, you can definitely follow the law and fulfill your duties in reporting things to the government, um, reporting things to various regulatory agencies, and still not be making positive ethical and moral decisions. Um, all of us have some experience with religion. Um, for those of us um, who've had experience with Christianity, for example, we get the Ten Commandments. Um, some people would say if you follow the eight or so commandments that relate to your interactions with other, others, you might be making moral decisions. Now, uh, that's something that we can reflect about and talk about here, too. Um, but the most important thing, and, and I think the thing that will provide you the most guidance with respect to moral decisions, is the social contract. We all have a social contract that we live by in our interactions with other people, and um, it's, it's very powerful. Um, things like help those less fortunate than you, take only what you need, um, and treat others the way that you'd want to be treated. When you go into the workplace, um, you've applied for your first job, you've negotiated a salary, you go in, you don't expect your boss to pay you half of what you negotiated as your salary, um, even though he probably could, um, because there's a social contract there. You assume that certain people are going to tell you um, certain truths and are going to stand by their truth. The, um, the most important ethical uh, construct that we're going to talk about here today and, and is related to um, the workplace is organizational ethics. So as a, as a worker, you bring certain ethical ideas and an experience of ethical decision making to the workplace. When you're faced with a new challenge, um, and we're going to go over some of those, and you don't have experience having made the same decision, what do you use to decide where to fall in that, that moral and ethical gray area? Um, usually, it's the organizational ethics that if they aren't the best source of ethical information for you, they should be the best source of ethical information for you. Um, all of us right now, even whether you're a, a contractor, an employee, a consultant, a student, um, you all have experience with the businesses that you're working with. Um, we all see on websites, usually the first thing when you Google a business is you'll see their mission, vision, values, uh, a marketing statement about who they are and what they represent. Now in this time of ethical crisis is the best time to sit back and, and look at your businesses, whether they be businesses you deal with, uh, businesses you're involved with managing, or businesses you work for. Um, what are their ethical principles? What are their mission? vision and values. And we're gonna talk about that um, a little bit more in detail here. So um, organizational ethics are driven by mission. Let's talk about mission first. Uh, mission is what your company does. It's a statement of your current status. Uh, we wanna be, or we are the most important and um, prominent 
provider of landscaping in Lackawanna County. That's a mission. That is a snapshot in time, and that's your current state. Um, the next thing is your vision. A vision is a, a statement about the future. It's where your company wants to be. What does it want to be in um, the landscape of its of its customers? Uh, we want to be the premier provider of computer solutions in Pennsylvania. Um, the next thing um, is, is the most important is your core values. Yeah, there we go. A lot of companies don't have core values. They focus on mission and vision. Identifying your core values is more than business planning. Um, it's people planning, it's customer planning, it's stakeholder planning. These are the kinds of decisions and kinds of statements with respect to core values that are going to guide your company and your workers as relates to ethical decision making. Um, in substance, core values are what support the vision, shape the culture, and reflect your company's values. They're your company's principles, beliefs, and philosophy. And all of these things drive organizational culture. Your organizational culture is your behavior of humans within the organization and the meaning that people attach to those behaviors. Um, let's go through a, uh, a really important example um, of how culture and organizational culture can um, fail a company that doesn't live what it preaches. Um, the, uh, the most important thing for this, this example that we're gonna go through are are your mission, visions, and values driving your culture? And is your culture clear and is it repeatable? If people don't understand what your values are and what your corporate culture are, they're not going to be able to rely on that in times of crisis like we have now. Sorry about that. Um, if your ethical leadership and your culture isn't repeatable, then it's not something that's reliable in times of culture, in times of uh, crisis. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to call it Every Bank USA. Imagine that you work for a national banking chain and your company's value proposition is everything we do is built on trust. It doesn't happen with one transaction in one day on the job or in one quarter. It's earned relationship by relationship. Customer relationships are key for keeping market share and for calculating bonuses. Imagine you're a few uh, new account sales shy of making the cut and getting your bonus of $20,000. If you open accounts for a few people who don't use their online accounts, let the final tally be made and then close them, you'll get your bonus, no one will know, and there's no harm done. Um, that's an ethical question of the type that people face in the workplace every day. Fudging numbers, um, working with the numbers, massaging numbers, we all have different names for it, but they're all varying um, ways of describing uh, subterfuge, uh, something that's not true and representing that it's true. The value proposition that I read to you is the value proposition of Wells Fargo. Um, and for those of you that have watched the news over the past couple of years, um, Wells Fargo paid hundreds of millions of dollars in fines for its account managers opening fake accounts and credit cards for people without their knowledge, um, getting bonuses and then closing them or sometimes even uh, not taking the time to close them but leaving them open. Um, it was a real ethical quandary for uh, Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo had the value proposition that everything we do is built on trust. It doesn't happen one transaction at a time, um, one day on the job, or even in one quarter. It's earned relationship by relationship. So if, if Wells Fargo went through the uh, process and, and the thinking and uh, the focus groups and discussions with customers, discussions with employees, um, and came up with, with trust as their main corporate culture and main corporate value, how does all this happen? Um, one of the things that um, Wells Fargo should have asked is, do my company policies reflect corporate culture? Despite the fact that Wells Fargo um, 
had trust as its main corporate culture and, and corporate focus, um, the company incentivized bonuses based on numbers, not employee satisfaction, not employee complaints, um, not customer satisfaction, not customer complaints, but numbers. The more accounts that you sold and managed, um, the larger your bonus. So one can easily understand in this, this very public example how your mission, vision, and values and corporate culture need to drive your policies. A company that is mainly concerned about trust needs to measure trust and needs to um, reward trust through its actions of its employees. Uh, you can't describe that trust is the main feature of your corporate culture and then incentivize raw numbers. Um, will the corporate values guide my employees to make the right decisions or are they too vague to be useful? Um, sometimes when I get a, a request by a, a local company to review their mission, vision, values, and ethical culture, I'll go on the website and I'll see something that says, um, our value is to always do the right thing. Uh, our value is to make our customers happy. Our biggest value is serving the community. All those things are very laudable goals if that's part of your vision. But one thing you have to remember is as you, if you're an employee sitting there um, at your office at six o'clock on a Friday night when there's no one else around and you have the opportunity to do something unethical um, and you reflect back on your corporate culture and the uh, value proposition of your company is always do the right thing. Is that something that's really helpful to you? Um, my position would be it's, it's too vague to be useful. You need to refine those things and, and drill down so that when your employees are by themselves with the opportunity to make an ethical decision or an unethical decision, they really have something that they can rely on to guide them. Um, and then the next thing is, do your corporate values cover the most common situations or do they reflect a disjointed understanding by the C-suite of the plight of the line workers? It's easy for all of us to say, um, do everything that's going to make the customer happy. And that's a very um, important goal really for any corporation that wants to have longevity from a business standpoint. But a lot of times customers will ask you to do things that maybe aren't ethical. Um, allow them to pay for something in cash instead of a corporate check. Um, add a little bit extra product that's not on the invoice. Um, things of that nature. What, what are your line workers, uh, the people who are actually connecting with the customers? What situations are they going to be in? Uh, they may not be uh, in the ivory tower in Manhattan. They, be, they may be meeting with people every day that they form relationships with. And people who you have relationships with will provide added pressures uh, based on friendship, based on the continuing nature of the relationship. And now in this time of crisis, um, when people aren't seeing each other face to face, maybe our desks are cleared with the multiple transactional things we would normally do on a daily basis. Now's the time to sit and reflect. Um, maybe I'm a manager of a division. What situations are my salespeople involved with on a daily basis? Um, what questions do I get? What questions do I think I should be getting um, that I'm not getting, which means what ethical decisions are being made outside the things that I'm seeing and what ethical decisions are um, my people struggling with. Um, we are partially uh, through, we're about midway through here. Um, if there's any questions, uh, please uh, add those to the Q&A. I can take a look at them and, and we can try and answer some of those. If anybody has them, I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay, I don't see any. Um, I want to um, skip forward to a, uh, one more please. Um, click it one more time. Nice, there's Shake Shack. For those of you um, who don't know about Shake Shack, Shake Shack was, uh, faced with an ethical decision in a time of crisis and arguably made the wrong decision. 
Um, Shake Shack has 8,000 employees in the United States, an average of 45 workers per location. Um, the CARES Act provides small businesses in the United States, the initial phase one, $349 billion for small businesses. Shake Shack obtained a $10 million PPP loan in a situation where it had $104 million in cash and current assets. Shake Shack ultimately had to return its entire $10 million US government loan because of public pressure. Now let's think about this from an ethical standpoint. Shake Shack has 45 employees per um, store, just maybe a little bit larger than some of the other um, chains or some of the other mom and pop shops that, and restaurants that we go to. And the fact that it was successful uh, from a corporate standpoint and had 80 or so of those stores um, makes it different than the mom and pop stores, but from an ethical standpoint, maybe not. The outcry from the public was, you know, Shake Shack is a national corporation and it has basically been allocated $10 million from monies that could have gone to local businesses that are um, family businesses. Um, so um, let's go back, go back one, yeah, sorry, hold on. Yeah, um, that could have gone to family businesses. Uh, the, real, the real point there is if you were the CEO of Shake Shack, how would you review the application for the government loan? Basically, Shake Shack is a conglomerate of a bunch of small businesses for various communities. A Shake Shack restaurant in Texas may um, employ various cooks, waitresses, um, waiters, maitre d's, cleaning staff, shippers, suppliers, uh, who all rely on the continuing economy for their families. Um, so if you look at it from a family standpoint, Shake Shack made an ethical decision in getting that money to help support its, its workers. Um, another, the other side of the coin would be, well, Shake Shack is a uh, huge corporation. They have $104 million hanging around that they could use to supply their employees with um, compensation during the shutdown. And instead they chose to take public money. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real quandary that a lot of us are going through at this time. So I would take you back to your mission, vision and values and your corporate culture. If you're applying for public monies, are you applying for monies that you really need to support your um, workers? Or are you asking for money that could go to people who are more needy? Um, let's go to hit one more. One of the things that I wanted to do for you is provide to you some ethical constructs that you can use during a time of crisis. This is probably some of the most important information because it's something that you'll take away and you can reflect on during the times that you're making ethical decisions. Um, the first one is called consequentialism. So for those of you who studied philosophy or psychology, this is the thinking of John Stuart Mill and naturalism. Whenever you're faced with an ethical decision, you think, how can my ethical decision result in the most good for the most people? So I'm relying on the consequences to drive my decision, not necessarily any specific rules. So the most uh, frequent, oh, I keep clicking the wrong one. The most frequent uh, thought exercise related to these ethical rules is the trolley problem. Uh, for those of you that have already uh, have experience with this, it's a little bit of a review. A trolley is flying down the tracks and there's five people in the way of the trolley as it's scheduled to go on track A. You are the switch operator and you have the opportunity to switch the track to track B where there's only one person on the tracks. And you might think, well, this is an easy one. Um, I'm going to endanger five people if I do nothing, and I'm gonna endanger one person if I switch the track. So five's more than one, obviously switch the track. 
Um, consequentialism would say that the only relevant aspect of the decision is doing the most good. And I know this is an, this is an, easy, uh, an easy ethical decision at this point, but think about how this might change. So if you don't know any of the five people on track A, but the person on track B is a family member who you really like, now you're into an ethical decision. Um, what's more important to you as an ethical decision maker, uh, endangering five people that you may not know or endangering one of your family members? And, and this is kind of the most important aspect of the trolley problem. All of us usually aren't faced with the five versus one people we don't know situation. That's an easy ethical decision. That's on one of the poles of the graph that I showed you before. It's in the 5% of things to obviously do. Um, now, knowing the family member, that puts you into the ethical gray area. And using consequentialism as a ethical guidepost means that you have to take yourself out of the equation. It's not what ethical decision would I make considering my own interests? What ethical decision would I make if I wasn't a party to this whole situation? Um, if I didn't know the person who was on track B? And that's really one of the most practical pieces of advice that you can give anyone who's about to make an ethical decision in the workplace is if somebody else was reviewing what I did, would they see that I inserted my own interests into this ethical decision. Um, if I'm a person who's responsible for distributing bonuses and I'm responsible in my company for distributing my own bonus. So say for example, I'm a sales manager. I also do some sales work. I have $100,000 of worth of bonuses to distribute to either the accounting department, the marketing department, the sales department. If I was part of the sales department, uh, that's an ethical pull. I, I want to provide the bonuses to the people that I work with, my friends. That's also going to include me. Um, so one of the things that you want to do when you're making an ethical decision is make sure you're sensitive to the fact that your own interests may sway the decision that you make. And that's why um, the trolley problem is is something that that's, that's useful. Um, the next thing, um, the other ethical guidepost that we use is called, uh, go ahead, click the next one, deontology. And that's a, that's a weird Greek rule, uh, Greek word that means focusing on the rules. And that's really what, what we need to consider ourselves here is are there hard and fast rules that we can use for ethical decision-making? So we talked about consequentialism. So that would be focusing on the consequences the ontology is focusing on the rules. And we've talked about some of those rules. Um, thou shall not kill, thou shall not harm other people. That's a rule, that's part of our social contract. When we make decisions in the workplace, we don't wanna harm other people. We wanna make decisions that get the job done, but don't put people in danger. Then I'll go back and think about the trolley problem. You are the um, switch master, the train is barreling down on track A on the five people, you have the opportunity to switch it to track B. Your rule is do no harm. By switching to track B, you're going, your action is gonna result in harming someone. Um, by leaving it on track A, you are letting the status quo take its form and you're not ethically responsible for the harm to those five people. Um, you are putting, you are put in a situation, an ethical situation, not of your own creation. And by doing nothing and following the rules, um, you have made an ethical decision. Well, that can be tough in certain situations because not acting is also an ethical decision. We face these things all the time. We see somebody in our company that's maybe doing something that you wouldn't consider ethical, but you think it's not my issue. Um, I don't wanna get involved. I don't want to bring heat on myself. I don't wanna risk my job or my relationship with that person or my boss. So you do nothing. Um, and one of the things that, that we try and impress 
upon workers and people who are in fiduciary capacities is being an ethical person also means speaking out when an ethical decision isn't seem to be yours to make. Um, we recently had a lot of news articles about whistleblowers in politics. Um, there's movies made about whistleblowers in the cigarette industry, um, the food industry, uh, the aviation industry. People are in harm's way um, because of ethical decisions that were poorly made by others. And if you have the opportunity, um, you're faced with an ethical decision that wasn't yours, an ethical time of crisis, um, it's the opportunity to be a leader. It's the opportunity to do the right thing. And maybe you don't have to risk your job or risk your career or risk your family by going public with something, but there's always somebody in your work situation or on your team or in your management chain that you can provide information to um, and give them the opportunity and work with them to make an ethical decision. One of the things that comes up frequently is the concept of business ethics. Any of us who have bought a car or negotiated a starting salary or maybe have collected information about a competitor have been within the landscape of, hey, it's just business. There are certain things that we do in business that are maybe ethically or morally suspect, um, but everybody understands that we're all on the playing field so people don't take it personally. Um, you hear the phrase, hey, it's just business, you know, buyer beware, things like that. Anytime you're, you're buying a car, you get asked the question, you know, what's the most you're, you're willing to pay for a uh, monthly payment? Or what are you thinking about a monthly payment? You purposely give a low number, knowing that you're going to be pushed higher and higher. And the converse is true too. When you see sticker price on a car, you ask the salesperson, you know, what, what, do I really, what am I really gonna pay for this car? And they give you a number that's maybe higher than what they really think the answer is because it's part of the negotiation. Um, one of the things that we try and, and impress upon people is that business ethics are really no different than personal ethics. That just because you're making a decision within the landscape of business, um, it's not any different. Use the same types of ethical uh, guideposts that you would if you were speaking with your wife or, or one of your family members or hanging out with friends. Just because you're in business doesn't mean you're no longer an ethical leader and an ethical decision maker. So be honest, um, use consequentialism, follow your rules, reflect on your company's values, value proposition, and culture. Those are the things that are going to guide you to make ethical decisions. Um, it is 2.40, go ahead. And um, we have the opportunity to have any questions, uh, discuss any, any topics on ethics that you would like to discuss. Anybody want to throw one in on a, on a Q&A or a, a chat? Okay, hold on, Janet raised her hand. Oh, okay, so Janet Keene. Actually, I wanna um, thank Janet. Um, I'm familiar with Janet and the Keene sisters from Keene Lake. And it's, uh, it's actually uh, kind of a little bit of a thrill for me to have them participate in the seminar and, and I really appreciate it. Um, the question is, are we born with somewhat of a moral comp compass? Observing the behavior of children ages three to six has made me wonder. Well, I've had two kids um, who have gone through the ages of three and six, and I'm, I'm still wondering, uh, to tell you the truth. You actually know them, so you're probably wondering too. Um, but really the question is, um, are we born with a moral compass or is this something that we learn? And the, the real answer to that question is, we learn through the observation of others. And one of the things that all of us have felt also is that gut reaction, that gut check. Um, all of us, because of our experiences, have an understanding of that social contract, what it's okay to do and what it's not okay to do. And you feel that pull in your gut that makes you think, well, is this a 
uh, a moral decision that I'm making? Is this an ethical decision that I'm making? And what I tell people is, if it feels like something's wrong, go with your gut. It's 100% something that you should reflect on and evaluate before making um, any sort of decision. Um, the next question we got is what happens when your core values sometimes are different than the stakeholders that you serve? And that's a great question because it goes back to um, some of the things that we talked about, your company values and your company culture. Company values are not just a marketing situation. Um, they're not virtue signaling. They're not great Instagram and Facebook feeds. Um, those core values are something that you really need to reflect on in order to make sure that you're um, making ethical decisions. And, and it's not just you. Um, it is those decisions that you make from the top flow down to your various workers. If um, one of my workers sees that it's okay to budget an expense report um, and you challenge them with it, um, if you get the answer, well, my manager said it's okay or it's something that my manager always does, that should tell you something about your, your value proposition and the culture of your corporation. Um, we are getting towards the end here on time. Um, for those of you that are very interested in this topic and want to do further reading, there's three books that I, I generally um, recommend. There's a lot of information out there, certainly on, on ethics and ethical decision making. But some of the three be best that I think are really accessible, one of them's Lying by Sam Harris. It's a very small book. I think it's less than 100 pages, but every page um, reads like a novel. And I think those of you um, who are interested in the topic would really enjoy it. There's another book, Ethics in the Real World, 82 Brief Essays on Things That Matter. It's a book that you can, you can have by your bedside and, and read an essay every once in a while when you have time. But probably one of, the, one of the best books that I think has come out in a long time is by Jordan Peterson called 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. And it's especially helpful now. Um, we're in a time of chaos. Um, you can find all these on Amazon and I'll, I'll make them available through links um, if you need to remember the titles of the authors. Really a good book. It provides you with 12 concrete rules on guiding yourself and, and making ethical decisions. And I think everyone would, would really enjoy it. Um, that is the end of uh, my presentation. I think John has some closing words, but again, thank you very much. Um, anyone who wants to contact me, um, here's my contact information. Please email me with any questions you may have, um, any ethical uh, situations that I can assist you with. You um, can always text me and my website has additional information about my company and the services that we provide. But again, thank you very much to John and Janet from Keystone College Professional Development Institute. Thank you very much for, from the Wyoming County Chamber of Commerce who's been very supportive um, of me in this, this process. And thank you all who had the opportunity to attend. Uh, again, I just want to thank Bill and Gina from Wyoming County Chamber and all of the participants that stayed on with us through this presentation. Um, I just want to leave with uh, just one quick phrase about the Professional Development Institute. Um, and lifelong learning is a key to continued career advancement for employees and organizations growth and sustainability. Providing opportunities for higher education to, our, to your employees is an investment in their future and the future success of your organization. Educational opportunities for growth and development can be linked to the retention. Um, so now during, as Bill said, this time, um, people have time and it's you know time to, a good time to look into uh, our programs from the Professional Development Institute and you know, with the possibility of you know, furthering your education or, you know, Unfortunately, if you're out of, you know, as an employer, bringing back and retaining great employees when this, when we get through this. But so I just want to thank everybody again. And um, so remember to check out our website, www.keystone.com. Uh, 
click on continuing education. You can find my information there, Janet's information, my cell phone's on there. Even if you want to send a text with a question, there's, you know, I'll answer at any time of the day or night. And um, yep, never hesitate to contact us. So I just want to say stay safe and thanks to Bill and Gina again. And that's all we got. I don't get chat. Okay. Um, and Kevin, yeah, I think, I don't know if everybody saw this, but Gina is going to post um, a recording of this on the Wyoming County Chamber of Commerce website and email everybody who's registered. So thank you again.